you wanted the best, you've got the best podcast. The hottest, hottest. podcast in the, world. in the world. The Chris Voss Show, the preeminent podcast with guests so smart you may experience serious brain bleed. The CEOs, authors, thought leaders, visionaries, and motivators. Get ready, get ready. Strap yourself in. Keep your hands, arms, and legs inside the vehicle at all times. Because you're about to go on a monster education roller coaster with your brain. Now, here's your host, Chris Voss. Hi, folks. This is Voss here for thechrisvossshow.com. There you go, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the show. We certainly appreciate you guys coming by. For 16 years, we bring in the smartest people, the CEOs, the billionaires, the White House presidential advisors, the Pulitzer Prize winners, the greatest authors who bring you their stories of fiction and nonfiction and their books and tales of the of their lives and their uh, uh, their economies, their times, and everything else. I'd heard this young man on the Sam Harris podcast, and I was just floored. Uh, I highly recommend you go check it out. I think it's about two or three hours of some of the most extraordinary in-depth uh, details of Ukraine, their history, Russia, et cetera, et cetera. And, of course, you can find it in his newest books. January 9th, it came out, 2024, and I recommend everyone give it a read, especially on the future of everything when it comes down to it, really. I think it's the linchpin to the to probably World War III for uh, anyone who wants to check into it. Uh, his newest book is out, Our Enemies Will Vanish, The Russian Invasion and Ukraine's War of Independence. Yaroslav Tromovov, uh, Trofimov is on the show with us today. Did I get that right on the second time there, sir? Uh, yes, sir, I did. Yes, sir, I did. There you go. PBS got me going a different direction on their video. Um, so welcome to the show. Uh, give us your dot-coms. Where can people find you on the interwebs? Uh, thank you so much for having me on the show. Uh, it's very simple. It's uh, yarotrof.com, Y-A-R-O-T-R-O-F.com. There and, you go. Uh, it's got all my books and, and appearances of shows like yours. There you go. Uh, now, you're the chief foreign correspondent affairs for foreign affairs uh, with the Wall Street Journal. You're a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in international reporting for two consecutive years. That's really great. 2022 and 2022. Uh, three. And before covering the Russian war in Ukraine, you reported on most major conflicts over two decades, serving as a journal's bureau chief in Afghanistan, Pakistan, as a correspondent in Iraq. And you hold an MA from New York at University, and uh, you're the author of Faith at War and the Siege of Mecca. So your newest book, give us a 30,000 overview of what's inside. Well, it's really a, a, a book about the first decisive year of the war in Ukraine, the Russian war in Ukraine. So I was there for most of, pretty much all of 2022 and, and large part of 2023. So the book starts uh, the day before the full-scale invasion, February 23rd, 2022. And then I kind of go through the country to the front lines uh, and talk to everyone uh, from soldiers in the trenches to civilians to uh, people suffering under Russian bombardments, and all the way up to the President Zelensky, to his generals and to... Uh, also to leaders of uh, Western nations, you know, uh, and intelligence agencies and military that also played a pretty important role in how this war is unfolding. And uh, kind of the, the, the other bookend is a one-year anniversary of the invasion where Ukraine does survive the initial onslaught by Russia and uh, where Zelensky holds his big press conference about three and a half hours and says, we've learned one big lesson. Nobody in the world likes losers. Yeah. So they create turn off the losing. It's been a it's been an interesting thing to watch. You know, I think everybody was kind of like, oh, I think we're done with all the wars now for a while, and we live in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, boy, that was uh, we were off on that. Why well, you've covered a lot of wars for two decades, as it's covered in your bio. Um, what makes this coverage of this war different for you personally? I mean, for me, obviously, uh, covering a war in a town where I was born, uh, where I was a child, uh, emotionally is a whole different game. You know, and, and, you know, wars are unpleasant business anywhere, and well, obviously you always have empathy with the you know, innocent people who are always caught uh, in this conflict. Uh, but in Ukraine, just walking the streets where every bit of geography had memories of my childhood, uh, you know, every building, you know, had associations from what I was doing as a teenager uh, or as a child, uh, felt like an insult. Mm. And uh, really, I was thinking, why? Why would somebody 
you know, be dropping bombs on this town. Uh, Kiev, you know, the city that is, you know, more than 1,500 years old. Yeah. Uh, that And a country that hasn't really done anything to provoke this because mm -hmm. this war is really an imperial war of aggression uh, by uh, President Putin of Russia, who just, you know, is reliving his imperial fantasies and and wants to go down in books as uh, in history books as the man who you know, brought back together the lost imperial possessions mm -hmm. of Russia. Yeah, the old USSR that he's been, I think he romanticizes, is that correct? Uh, not just that, I mean, he compared himself to Peter the Great, yeah. you know, the 18th century emperor who conquered a lot of lands that are now uh, in Ukraine, for example, or in, in NATO, such as Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania. There you go. So uh, we'll round back to the book. Uh, but one thing that was interesting too is where does the title come from? I was when I first saw the title, I was like, "What does our enemies will vanish mean?" Tell us the origin of that, if you would. Yeah. So that that is a line in the Ukraine's national anthem. Uh, the anthem itself was written in the 1860s at the time where not 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 just the Ukraine, independent Ukraine didn't exist. Even speaking about it was a criminal offense in Russia. Uh, the Ukrainian language was banned. He couldn't print books in Ukrainian. Hmm. And so uh, this was a clandestine, um, uh, really a clandestine book. Hmm. Sorry, a clandestine uh, a song that was banned for you know more than a century. Wow. And uh, the line goes, our enemies will vanish like dew at sunrise, uh, which is a very romantic way for the enemies to vanish. To vanish. You know, it's not, not a bloodbath and not a uh, some sort of martial music to it. It's just an expectation of Ukrainians that they want to be left alone. Mm -hmm. And I think this is what the war is about. You know, Ukrainians just want to be left alone to live the way they choose and not be told by Russia uh, what language to speak, you know, where to go on vacation, with whom to trade, and which books to read. And that's yeah. really as basic as that. Yeah. The, the same sort of thing that, you know, started our country, the USA. You know, we want we, people want freedom. They want exactly. to live their life the the way they want without tyranny and domination and uh although i don't know some in america seem to think that's a great idea these days um but we'll see <laughs> hopefully, hopefully uh we have better angels uh that will prevail in 2024 um and democracy will continue but you know ukraine you know this is the spirit of the uh, this is the human spirit really when it comes down to it and i think uh you know when the when the founders wrote our constitution they they you know acknowledge it with certain lines that that spoke to the human nature the human condition of wanting to be free to be wanting to be um to have enough freedom to be able to do whatever they wanted and uh that's really important tell us a little bit about your journey uh, and your history some of the feel free to touch on some of the books uh how you were raised in ukraine i guess and born there um tell us about your upbringing and what shaped you into becoming a news journalist and uh, finding that important and and why, why why it is that motivates you to chase these wars around i mean it's, it's dangerous business around the world it's, it's certainly dangerous business uh, so i was born in ukraine Mm -hmm. uh, but when I was only six years old, my uh, parents went to Madagascar in, in Africa. My dad was a professor of uh, statistics at the university. And so I kind of grew up uh, partially in, in French-speaking Africa, which was very eye-opening and um, kind of you know, gave me a whole new life experience. <laughs> uh, and then uh, we went back to Ukraine, and then my parents ended up in New York. and. Uh, you know, I started covering conflicts around the world, you know, and at, at the end of last century, actually. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was I was in Rome uh, working for the Wall Street Journal as as Italy correspondent covering fashion and beautiful things. And, uh, uh, you know, <clears throat> uh, and the that, of fashions. Oh, exactly. Uh, on 9-11. And because I spoke some Arabic, uh, mm -hmm. I got on the plane that evening. Mm -hmm. And for Egypt and then the Gulf, and then was sort of covering what was known at the time as the global war on terror. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the invasion of Iraq and then Afghanistan. Um, well, first Afghanistan, then Iraq. Uh, and I spent a lot of time in Baghdad, and then in Kabul and, uh, and Saudi Arabia. So I wrote the book about the siege of Mecca, 1979, mm -hmm. which was really a pivotal moment in, in the history of the Muslim world where. Um, you know, 100,000 hostages were taken in the Grand Mosque in Mecca uh, by the Islamist extremists 
uh, that kind of were the precursors of today's Islamic State, ISIS. Mm -hmm. uh, and kind of throughout all his career, as a journalist, I really tried to stay away from Ukraine. And Ukraine, thankfully, didn't really need much coverage for a big stretch of that because it was a country at peace. Yeah. Uh, I remember going there in 2004 where Ukraine had this orange revolution, you know, uh, an uprising against an attempt to steal a presidential election. Mm -hmm. And I came there from Baghdad after, you know, mayhem and you know, my friends were kidnapped and killed and, and I was quite traumatized. And so I, I remember coming to Ukraine and seeing how peaceful it all was and how all this change was achieved with, uh, you know, not even a shop, some shop window broken, not a single, you know, person injured. Mm -hmm. And it was, I felt very proud about that. And, and that, of course, was a conflict within Ukraine, between Ukrainians, among Ukrainians. Yeah. Uh, but then things changed in 2014, you know, it was the first, the beginning of the Russian invasion. And you know, we all sort of say, you know, the war began two years ago, but the war really began 10 years ago when mm -hmm. Russia took over Crimea and then sparked a, a really violent conflict in the Donbass region. 14,000 people died at the time. Uh, and then, you know, things became darker and darker. And uh, mm -hmm. The uh, it, let me ask you this question because this was bugging me when I was you know I, I've loved studying history um, and what we do as America I love the chessboard watching how one move affects another uh, I mean sometimes the, you don't really love the chessboard but you know our our Americans ability to try and put our fingers on the scale and we end up making things completely worse especially for us sometimes um you know you look at how we how we uh funded uh osama bin laden for years uh, with war and guns and stuff and then he turns well not not indirectly i mean the mujahideen in yeah. Afghanistan. yeah and then you know he turns on us and and you know we're, we're always mucking around cuba you know you, you name it that i think we've screwed up most of south america over the decades um and uh, you know, watching watching the 2014 war, the bombers red lines in Syria getting crossed. You know, seeing you know how this plays out and and the moves that are made on the world stage has always has always interested to me. me. Um, one thing I was curious about is if I would have been Biden, and I remember thinking this uh, up to a week or two before the. Um, the invasion when when uh, it was clear that Ukraine was surrounded by tanks and everything, and I'm like, if I were Biden, I just I just go fucking land a whole mess of U.S. military in in all their cities. Like I just put everybody on plane and do it and like block them as a chess piece. But uh, do was it was it true that uh, Zelensky wasn't fully on board that he, he was really going to get invaded? That maybe they were playing bluff. Well, uh, so uh, I think I think Zelensky, until the very last moment, didn't really believe yeah. that Russia would launch a full-scale invasion. I mean, he believed the war was coming, yeah. but he thought it would be a war for Donbas, for the East, not necessarily a war for Kiev. Mm -hmm. And there was a reason for them uh, to disbelieve American intelligence warnings, mm -hmm. because the Russian army that was all over the borders with Ukraine was quite small about 200,000 soldiers, maybe less. Mm -hmm. And it clearly wasn't enough to invade all of Ukraine, as as events have actually turned to that to be. Yeah. You know, it only made sense if you believe that the Ukrainians will not resist, which is clearly what Putin did believe, because he sort of drank his own Kool-Aid and believed his own propaganda that the Ukrainians and the Russians are one people, and you know, mm -hmm. these men will be greeted as liberators. Yeah. But Zelensky did know that the Ukrainian army will fight. And so he, I don't think he thought he imagined that Putin would be so sort of captive of his own illusions yeah. to launch a war with so little preparation. We'll be greeted as liberators. Like that line always worked out well. Maybe Putin should have called George Bush. W. Well, you know, I was in Iraq in 2000. I actually drove into Iraq in 2003 from Kuwait. Mm -hmm. And American soldiers were greeted as liber liberators for about a week. Oh, really? For about a week? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, we, we got but that. then, you know, occupations are nasty business, no matter how good the intentions are. Uh, you know, if you're in a foreign country, you don't know the culture, trample up on local customs unwittingly or wittingly. And obviously, it's much harder, you know, in, in a place like Ukraine, where there was no nobody greeting them as liberators. Yeah. I, who knew that we were going to unleash the linchpin between the Sunnis and the 
and the she is, I think. And then, of course, you know, he was holding Iran at bay with the Iran Iraq war, Saddam was. I mean, technically, he, the guy was an evil, bad guy, but technically, things were kind of under control in that area. Really, want to come down to it, and they didn't have WMDs either. I don't know. Did, what's your What's your thoughts on that? I think. Um, uh, well, I remember talking to a lot of Shias before that war, and the war sort of you know, the regime was really brutal in Iraq, yeah. especially for Shias or for the Kurds. And a lot of people are today happy that Saddam is gone, mm -hmm. but obviously the horrors that the botched intervention and the botched occupation unleashed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, destroy the entire generation of Iraqis. I mean, the same in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. It's it's really hard, and you know, even even with the best intentions, to run a foreign country. It is. I'm trying. I've been trying to run uh, uh, Belize for from from uh, Las Vegas for like two years, and it's not working out well. Um, <laughs> Uh, so one thing that was interesting to me in, in the book and Sam Harris' discussion is your, uh, your education and your knowledge on Russia and its historical sort of nature, its defense and, and how it looks at its borders as a USSR sort of borders, its access points to defend itself in war, its thought processes on, on whether this was inevitable or not. Uh, if you want to speak to some of that uh, or tease some of that out in the book, I'd love to hear it because that really, I think more people need to hear that and read your book because so they can understand the Ukraine war and they can understand that once that domino falls, if it falls, uh, it really becomes, it really becomes a, a, a Nazi sort of, you know, mold, uh, mold, Moldova and other countries can easily just fall and, and it can become a domino effect, much like what you saw with the Nazis. Well, I would go more, more in Moldova, I think. You know, I was just in Estonia and, uh, and I spoke to people in Poland. And in all these countries, there is this dread that in a year or two, if Ukraine is allowed to collapse because of the cutoff in American funding, mm -hmm. you know, war will come there. You know, the young people are talking about, you know, shall we buy a house in Spain? Instead of to have somewhere to flee. And that's in countries that are in NATO that the US is committed to defending possibly with nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Putin's ambitions are very clear. You know, first of all, he wants all of Ukraine, and he keeps saying that. <clears throat> and he has compared himself to Peter the Great, you know, the collector of Russian lands. Uh, and he spoke of cities like Marv and Estonia as Russian soil. So if you remember what the Russians demanded from the US, before uh, the invasion, you know, in February 20, January 2022, they basically wanted NATO to be rolled back to the Cold War boundaries. They wanted, you know, the U.S. to yield control of sovereign nations in Eastern and Central Europe back to Russia. So that's that's what they're that that that, that is what the aim is. Mm -hmm. Obviously, it's it's really hard to achieve because right now, you know, it has taken Russia a year to take one town of 30,000 people in Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, but if left unchecked, you know, and if if Russia manages to gobble up Ukraine and use its resources, its men and its uh, its industries to beef up its war machine, you know, the rest of Europe very rightfully senses that it's in danger. Yeah, especially if someone comes into office in 2024 who's more nationalist and doesn't really have a regard for globalism, democracy, and and uh, NATO. Of course, it seems to be very anti-NATO. <clears throat> and, you know, we're, we're on the precipice of testing, what is it, like 70 years that we've had NATO um, in, in place, uh, testing what that means if Ukraine falls. Like, it's, a, it's an important strategic point. And, and the amount of, the amount of I th I'm not sure if it was you or someone else, but someone said our defense budget is for Ukraine that we've spent is maybe 1% of our whole national um uh, revenue or income or what, whatever the hell it is. It's a very small amount. Yeah, it hasn't exactly. cost us, it hasn't cost us any American blood, at least not in soldiers that we've intentionally put on the ground to my knowledge. Yeah, absolutely. It's, you know, I mean, let, let's look at the facts, you know, about half of Russia's military stockpile, you know, it's tanks, army personnel carriers, artillery pieces have been destroyed in this war yeah. at a cost of a fraction of the American defense budget, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. And also the European ones, because the Europeans pay about half of, uh, of the overall foreign military aid. And zero 
uh, lives lost uh, on the part of the U.S. military or other allied militaries. And all the fighting, all the dying is done by Ukrainians and by a small number of foreign volunteers, including Americans, who come there to fight on the revolution because they empathize so much with the Ukrainian cause and, you know, they're horrified by the atrocities mm-hmm. that Russia has committed. Yeah, it's... Uh... It's it's a thing that you know. I mentioned this to you in the green room before the show, where I remember watching the Russians because I really love Churchill, and watching not the Russians but watching um, England and the House of Lords discuss uh, go ahead and sell you know plane parts and engine parts to the Nazis Germany pre Nazi Germany or uh, not Nazis when they were running Germany and and uh, we're kind of down and out from uh, World War One and like yeah, what's the worst that could happen you know they just had this lazy fair sort of like uh, we'll make some money and you know everyone's kind of making money off of uh, Germany and you know what's the worst that can happen and then it just goes and I, I seem to see a lot of echoes of that in the uh, GOP house and how they they don't want to fund Ukraine and of course they're doing all sorts of things so they're hoodwinking hoodwinking with fascism Victor Orban Hungary um, uh, the, the love of Russia if you understand what goes into that and the background of that and why they think it's a great country um, it's really weird because I don't know about you but I I grew up cowering under the desk of the USS uh, of my steel desk in my elementary school thinking it would protect me from nuclear bombs in the USSR mm-hmm. and to see where we're at America now where we're just like well let's dance with Russia uh, and pretend everything is fine and be friends especially with Tucker Carlson going over there and towing the Republican line. I'm just like, what What an extraordinary place we moved to as a country. But it's really bizarre because, uh, you know, what we have seen after uh, in the last few years is that uh, in Europe, the European far right, that used to be pro-Putin, mm-hmm. has moved away from Russia quite significantly. You know, you, will, you know the, the Italian... Uh, Prime Minister, you know, Giorgio Meloni is one of the fiercest supporters of Ukraine and she runs a party with roots in the Italian fascist, in the original fascist party. Yeah. You know, in France, uh, you know, uh, the far right is not, you know, is saying that it condemns the war and it supports Ukraine. It's not voting necessarily the parliament that way, but at least it says the right things. And, and the same, you know, in Sweden and other places in Scandinavia. And that's in Europe that has really suffered economically Mm-hmm. Because it had to cut off its dependence on Russian gas, and and it's paying the price. And still, you have this swing of public opinion behind Ukraine because Ukraine is not something uh, abstract. You know, everybody knows Ukrainian refugees. There are millions and millions of all over mm-hmm. Europe, most women and children. But in America, somehow, which is not paying no economic price for this, you know, America has not didn't have much trade with Russia, didn't depend on gas, and it's really no leverage. Except in the sort of in the in the idea in the ideological space that Russia has over Americans, and yet you have this kind of very strange wave of sympathy for Putin and his goals in Ukraine and, and the Russian talking points and be pirated all over you know, the former Twitter, for example, uh, including by Elon Musk. So uh, it's it's really strange to observe this from the outside. Yeah, he seems to be trying to play all the cards. In his favor and most most i mean most millionaires do they they love these countries that they can do whatever they want in and they don't like the regulations that we have here we've had a lot of authors on to discuss that um you talked about the refugees in in uh ukraine uh you know we've we've seen how the syrian refugees really changed the map changed national nations attitudes um and made made more nations kind of closed off you know there's the brexit even in america we seem to have uh we seem to t- turn towards our darker angels if you can call them angels darker demons um and uh with you and and, and those people don't appear to ever be going back to syria especially because uh what's his face is still in power mm-hmm. but is, is there is there a way that let's just uh work from a perfect sort of um, sort of uh, the good beats evil. If if Ukraine was there, or, or uh, Russia was ever to back off, or maybe they'd have to settle on what they've grabbed so far, or maybe they would settle with whatever they had in 2014. If, if somehow this ended positively in some manner for Ukrainians to still have their freedom in their country, is do you see those people coming back, those refugees, or after two years and maybe? 
uh, still under the threat of Russia, people are just going to go, fuck it, we're just going to uh, adopt a new country and move on? Or, or is there enough uh, love of their country to come back? I think it's very different uh, from the Syrian uh, refugee wave. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and there is one reason for that. You know, man of military age, which is defined as man until the age of 60, cannot leave Ukraine mm -hmm. normally. Uh, and so uh, the vast majority of these refugees are women, children, and the elderly. So they all have their loved ones back in Ukraine. Yeah. And they're not building a new life abroad in many cases without them. And so already, you know, millions of people who fled in the first weeks and months of the war came back. They came back to Ukraine. Mm -hmm. It's not hard, it's not far, and, uh, and you know, the dangers are there, you know, but, you know, people have learned to live under this, you know, occasional missile strikes and drone strikes. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think the vast majority of the Ukrainians who are abroad will probably come back. Mm -hmm. to Ukraine uh, and the the reception in Europe has been uh, you know very welcoming it's yeah. it's very different from the receptions that unfortunately the Syrians have had but also it's because you know Ukrainians were not something new I mean even before the war two million Ukrainians worked in Poland mm -hmm. and you know the border was open Ukrainians didn't need a visa to go to Europe mm -hmm. and uh, you know it was it was it was it was it was just something normal for them to to be, you know, in Germany, in France, or Poland. Definitely. Um, you know, and you mentioned that the Ukrainian war, uh, as a proxy war for the U.S., technically, I guess, or mm -hmm. a proxy draining of the, of the, uh, of the Russian inventory, has done just extraordinary things for this. It's exposed, you know, we've had so many different military leaders who've written books on the show, people who've, you know, run the uh, aircraft carriers and different things on the show, um, major admirals. Um, you know, the, the, the exposing that they have done, and I think this has put China on its heels a little bit too, is the exposing that the Russian military was so corrupt, was so, you know, I mean, the, the old, the, the kleptocracy that Putin is and how, you know, there's just corruption and everything and stealing of money that probably was never going to the military by the heads of the military and stuff, um, has just exposed all of that. I think, I think a third of the ships in Russia's military, in fact, some of their, their most favored pieces have been sunk. In the Black Sea Fleet, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think the Black Sea, Black Sea Fleet, I just recently saw, has had to move back, hasn't it? Giving the ship well, I have to move ships, ships from the Crimean Peninsula to mm -hmm. Novorossiysk further away. Yeah, I think, I think in March they took out two ships, or maybe it's in the first quarter of 2024. I don't know. They, 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 there was a point where there was a ship every few days. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's a lot it, of ships. Yeah. We recently had uh, the gentleman, uh, George Takak, who, who put out uh, Cold War 2.0, Artificial mm -hmm. Intelligence, the New Battle Between China, Russia, and America. And one of the most amazing things is, is seeing the Ukrainians be so innovative and inventive. I mean, they've literally changed the face of war to sure. just drones that you can buy off a shelf. I recently saw this thing where they're mounting the bombs to, like, mobile you know, they, the, the Russians have figured out the drone thing. And so now they've got like basically ground activated four wheel drones that will roll mm -hmm. up to places. The, uh, it's extraordinary to watch the videos of the drone boats going right up to, which are basically like ski dudes going up to uh, take down giant ships and targeting them in the most, you know, where the fuel is and the, and the armaments to, to get the most maximum damage. It's just extraordinary. Um, any of your thoughts on that and, and how, how that's really changed the future war can, and also if I might follow that up too, can the, can the Ukrainians sustain this? Do they have enough manpower and bodies on the ground to, to go through this and keep this up or, or are they losing ground now? Well, I'll start with the, with the second question, which is, which is easier to answer. Sure. I mean, the Ukrainians are losing ground, uh, slowly, not, not a lot of ground, lost one, one town since May last year. Uh, and they're losing ground because uh, of the funding shortfalls, uh, because the Congress hasn't moved on aid requests for Ukraine uh, since, I think, 
November. Mm -hmm. And they just don't have enough ammunition, don't have enough shells. Mm -hmm. The Russians have a six to one advantage, maybe a 10 to one advantage, depending on the stretch of the front. Mm -hmm. And that's the main reason. So do they have enough men? Uh, they, there are enough men in the country to keep fighting. And mm -hmm. uh, more importantly, what are the other options? Mm -hmm. You know, everybody knows that surrender is not an option because yeah. Ukraine has a deep historical memory of all the bad things that happened uh, in, in when they surrender, you know, and the Russians, you know, are very clear about their plans. They want to physically annihilate, execute, you know, the Ukrainian elites and re-educate the children of Ukrainians to make them into Russians. Yeah, they've already sold a number of uh, large numbers. Yeah, yeah, but they want to do it to everyone. So you know, the you know, they're pretty genocidal in their in their plans. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, the change of the face of war, the drone revolution is really a big, big change, mm -hmm. and I don't think the U.S. military has internalized just how everything is different now. Yeah, there are now two countries in the world that are the cutting edge of drone technology: it's Ukraine and Russia, mm -hmm. and. Uh, just how it's transformed it is you know in every facet of of of, of the military operations mm -hmm. from you know squad level drone usage you can now fly these little 300 dollar drones the fpv sort of first person view drones and mm -hmm. destroy a tank that is worth millions of dollars <laughs> the, yeah, and and the, you know, for for one tenth of a price of one shell that mm -hmm. is nowhere near as accurate and then you know, just just last few days, you know, the Ukrainians flew a drone more than a thousand miles away uh, to the outer reaches of Russia to hit oil refineries and you know a Russian military facility assembling drones, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the strike drones that, that target Ukraine almost every night. <laughs> so uh, soon, nowhere in Russia will be safe because of the reach of these drones, which is you know transformational because Ukraine is trying to achieve deterrence against Russian missile strikes using very cheap domestically produced drones, because let's, let's not let's forget that none of the weapons that the U.S. has supplied to Ukraine are allowed to be used against targets inside Russia. Do you think that, you know, that, that we should be giving long-range airplanes to Ukraine? I think, I think the, I, I assume the fear has been that you know, they'll use them to fly into Russia, and then we kind of enter a war or we enter a nuclear situation. Um, uh, tell us what you think there. I've watched the, it's been extraordinary to watch some of the videos of where I think the, I think the Ukrainians fly their, their old Russian helicopters down the highway, just barely above the traffic. Mm -hmm. I think they do that for cover. But yeah. uh, wa watching some of that is just extraordinary. And, you know, I guess Ukrainians are like, eh, whatever, it's just a copter going by three feet above our heads. Um, tell us a, a little bit about that. Well, I mean, Ukraine has has been pretty good at uh, not uh, using foreign weapons to strike Russia. Because mm -hmm. a lot of the other kind of gear, aside from the HIMARS, uh, multiple rocket launch systems that were supplied in July 2022, we're giving to Ukraine on um, condition that it won't be used against Russia. Mm -hmm. And it's not using them against Russia. No. The U.S. Is, has been reluctant to give Ukraine uh, cruise missiles mm -hmm. because of this case. But the French and the British did give Ukraine cruise missiles, uh, the Storm Shadows, which were used very efficiently uh, to take out the ships in Crimea. Mm -hmm. But again, were not used to strike targets inside Russia. So Ukraine has uh, kept its word in this. And Ukraine is getting the F-16s, They're not maybe the top of the line fighter jets, but certainly much better than what Ukraine has now. So Ukrainian pilots are currently uh, training to fly them, and uh, the first batch uh, should probably arrive in the next few months. And those, those jets are not provided by the U.S. They're provided by uh, European partners, by countries like the Netherlands, mm -hmm. uh, like Denmark, uh, that uh, you know have a fleet of F-16s that they're uh, phasing out and replacing with more modern aircraft. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the other benefits the U.S. of this war is, it, it's hard to say, well, there's a benefit to a war. People are dying and, and there's human tragedy and suffrage and the mm -hmm. horrors of this will, I'm sure, will be felt, the trauma will be felt for ages to come. But one of the other benefits that Americans need to look at is this has been cleaning up a lot of crap inventory the U.S. had. 
um, and and getting our updates. Uh, and and it it when the, when American what I'm trying to say is when Americans think of the cost of this war, we're not sending them the latest most expensive newest shit we put out this is some of the stuff that we've just been had laying around that probably needed to get updated and some of it was probably redundant or you know getting aged mm. uh and so we're not it's it's just not costing us a lot to do this war and help the ukrainians and for what it will cost us if ukraine falls most people i think of any sane mind or intelligence or studied history um and that's why i love your book and how it talks about the human or the russian and the way they look at things and the way they the way their attitudes are towards this that, that just really alarmed me because i was like holy shit these guys are really fucking serious and they're going all the way but uh it, you know people just don't realize how cheap this war is especially when it comes to american lives when it comes to cost uh, using it as a proxy war is probably more expensive than anything we've been up to in Ukraine and Afghanistan and other crazy places where we were doing a lot of stupid stuff. Well, you know, in Afghanistan, one U.S. soldier cost $1 million a year. Wow. Just one, one G.I. Joe. That, that was the cost of direct war. You know, mm -hmm. Astronomically expensive. You know, and, uh, and again, you know, the, as you said, no Americans have to die for Ukraine. Ukrainians are doing their own fighting. Ukrainians now have the biggest army in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, and they are uh, fighting very fully cognizant of the fact that, you know, if they were to lose, the war would come to their neighbors, and and neighboring countries know that too. Yeah, there's a lot of uh, the reason why so many European countries are emptying out their stockpiles of weapons and ammunition and sending it to Ukraine is precisely that. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as for the stuff that Ukraine is getting from the U.S., some of it is old, some of it is new. There are two different programs. Mm -hmm. One is the presidential drawdown authority, where existing stocks are being uh, handed over. Another one is this U.S. Uh, USAI initiative, which creates jobs in American uh, factories to make new stuff for Ukraine. Yeah, and so a lot of a lot, yeah. a lot of that program is actually a job creation program in the U.S. Yeah. Oh, making uh, making and supplying new armaments. Um, now, since you wrote your book just recently, a few weeks ago, there was the attack by ISIS-K mm -hmm. in Russia that killed, uh, I think, 140-plus people. Mm -hmm. um, I, I guess this turned out we actually... I guess, I guess I'd heard of our duty to warn, but it had been a long time since I've heard it. We actually warned Putin three days before. We have some sort of duty to warn policy that even though they're enemies of ours, I don't know, I guess it's some nice thing that we do to say, hey, like some shit can go down in your country, eh? And because it would kill people that are innocent. Um, so good for us. Well, it's not probably a duty, but it's a, it's, it was a conscious decision to, yeah. to do it. So how do you see, you know, there's talk now that he he's going to use that war to blame the Ukrainians. He's going to use that to, to pull up more conscripts and maybe pull up 100,000 to 200,000 Russian troops. Uh, how do you see that playing into the future of Ukraine war? Well, obviously, Putin has already blamed Ukraine, and that mm -hmm. was to be expected. You know, you cannot spend two years saying that you're waging an existential war, you know, against an enemy that wants to destroy you, and then, you know, be told you were fighting the wrong enemy, and actually, it's not these guys, it's those guys who are blowing up, uh, you know, your city, and then killing, you know, 140,000, 40 of your civilians in a, in a, in a concert hall. So, uh, but I think a lot of people in Russia believe that. But this is this is the talking point of the Russian regime. Uh, now, the problem with mobilizing troops is that it's really hard for the Russians too. You know, last time they tried you know, hundreds of in September, October, twenty twenty two, uh, you know, several hundred thousand, maybe a million Russian citizens escaped the country, mm -hmm. and because they didn't want to go and die in Ukraine. And then there is a question of you know, okay, well you have the soldiers, but what are they going to drive? Uh, what weapons are they going to have? How are you going to train them? Who's going to train them if like, most of the officer corps is either killed or injured or fighting in the trenches? Mm -hmm. uh, so mobilization is difficult for Russia. Uh, if it had this magic wand and this ability to sort of mobilize its troops and, and send a you know, million men army into Ukraine, it would have done it already. It would have been bogged down in this war that is now taking a toll. Uh, not just on its army, and but also its economy, because you know that's the Ukraine in the last few months has managed to destroy a significant part of the Russian oil refining capacity with its drone strikes, for example. Yeah, take. I mean, 
Russia is just a giant fucking gas station. I mean, that's really all it really is, is, is an oil gas station. And sadly, our, uh, what was it? Um, uh, India just helped put a shot in their arm by buying a bunch of their gas, um, which is, thanks, India. Way to go. Um, and well, what it's cheap. Why yeah, wouldn't they? Yeah. I guess if you need the gas and you're, you're the, I, the probably the most probably the future leading developing uh, economic uh, uh, country in the world. Um, it, it looks like China is faltering now. Finally, um, it, we were talking again with uh, uh, with the the author George Tuka of the uh, Cold War 2.0. And what's interesting is how many of even with the blockades and the embargoes, how many of parts around the world are finding their way into this drone strike battle um yeah and in still into the russian things they're still able to get these parts and evidently from what we've talked to with these authors is it, it's really hard to stop you know where, where it's easy to stop arms we're like hey there's a whole ship full of tanks maybe we should stop that ship it's really hard to stop these these little parts and chips from getting to the Russians and helping them build. And of course, Iran's part of that as well. Right. And, you know, I, you know, there's lots of Western companies making a lot of money on this. And mm -hmm. there's been a surge in exports to the countries on Russia's periphery, you know, all the Armenia, Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan's of this world. And obviously, it's very clear to everyone concerned that it's not for local consumption, it just gets smuggled to Russia. Mm. Wow. But, you know, people are greedy. Yeah. Greed and war. Jeez. It's almost, like, uh, it's almost like Dick Cheney in, uh, when he was president. Uh, and uh, Halliburton. <laughs> Those no big contracts. It was always weird how that worked out. Um, but uh, I guess that's that's the essence of, of the darkness of human nature. What have we talked about that you want to tease out to people on the mm -hmm. book to get them to pick up or maybe to put thoughts in their minds? about why this war is important and and why Ukraine really needs to be able to win this war? Well, I think, you know, in, in the book, I'm really telling the stories of the people who are fighting. And, you know, it's not some sort of exotic conflict. There are people like you and I, uh, like people like people who listen to you, who had the same aspirations, the same desires, the same career path before it started, you know, go on vacations, you know, some tropical country and... One of the characters used to run a dive shop in Phuket in Thailand. When the war began, he came back, became a commander, mm -hmm. was one of the leaders of the uh, Ukrainian forces in the siege of Mariupol, the deadliest episode of the war, you know, when the Russians flattened the city, you know, killed tens of thousands of people there. And then I trace his story as he's fighting, you know, sort of the final battles, some 300 Spartans, you know, refused to surrender until the order to do so by Zelensky. And then taken captive by the Russians, tortured in Russian prisons. And then after Ukraine launched this miracle offensive in September 2022 in Kharkiv and took a bunch of Russian officers captive, he was traded back hmm. and, uh, you know, was freed in exchange for the Russians and is now leading you know, the fight again. So this is the stories of this kind of people that are really inspirational, uh, but also... Uh, you know, I'm varnished, you know, I tell it sort of words and all. And uh, I'm just, I was just trying to humanize the narrative as much as possible. So people could relate to it. It's not, it's not, it's not some sort of geopolitical, you know, game of risk. It's, it's real people with real tragedies, real losses, but also real hopes and real successes, real triumphs, yeah. and, and doing sometimes very inspiring and amazing things. And I think that is the strength of the book because, you know, I wasn't just, you know, being a pundit sitting in a nice office, I actually, you know, I was to my knees in mud, uh, you know, dodging shells and bullets uh, where the action was. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's, and it's, it's, uh, I was watching a video recently, and I'm hoping that, I don't know if this will change the, the front of the war, but um, it was an, it was a Ukrainian soldier, and he was talking about how uh, inept and uh, un, um, uh, untrained these conscripts are and he was telling he was basically mm -hmm. telling the scenario of a battle they had i don't know if this is pr but it seemed like it seemed pretty real but he was telling him as how the conscripts were you know the these russian soldiers that were you know just mucking it up in war and putting their whole 
their whole troop into the firing line by the way they were mobilizing and moving towards the Ukrainians uh, just ignorantly end up getting a lot of them slaughtered and is there is there is there a chance that Ukrainians could can win this war just by attrition you know I, there's the joke I think that came out of the State Department where you know we used to think the Russians were the you know one of the top armies in the world now we find out they're the second best army in Ukraine um, yeah, yeah, that's what Blinken said. Uh, well, I mean, uh, for a while it seemed to be true. Uh, I think the Russians are also learning the lessons, and the Russians are not stupid. And in uh, two years into the war, they've developed you know, new approaches that are sometimes successful. Mm. Uh, I think Ukraine can win the war of attrition uh, for the simple reason that Russia is running out of tanks, artillery pieces, and all kinds of other gear. At a rate faster, it can rebuild or repair or refurbish. Mm -hmm. Ukrainians destroy you know, several dozen tanks every week, and it has nowhere else to get them from. Mm -hmm. uh, so, in two years, maybe you know, one year, uh, maybe in three years, depending on how the war goes, Russia will just not be able to sustain it anymore. Yeah. Whereas Ukraine, you know, can rely on the industrial base of the West. You know, the Germans, if they really get their heads into it, can make a lot more tanks. Yeah, and the French can make a lot more artillery pieces. So that's where we're at. So uh, not this year because this year is the European industry is just starting to ramp up, mm -hmm. but they are, and the U.S. is you know frozen because of the inaction by the Republicans on the House. Yeah. Uh, but if if the stars align, Ukraine definitely has a chance uh, to win this. So the EU and in Europe may be able to close the gap for providing more armaments and stuff like that that may well they're certainly doing it now i mean the reason why ukraine is in the fight right now is because of uh, the european initiatives you know the czech prime minister just you know scoured the markets on his own initiative and and found more than a million shells and then got other the the europeans wow. to put in money to buy them uh so uh the europeans are definitely standing standing in uh now because and stepping up because they know that for them, Ukraine is a direct national security issue. It's not for America. I mean, for America, you know, Russia taking over Eastern Ukraine is not a threat to the American homeland today. Mm -hmm. It is a threat to America's global standing, to its ability to influence and benefit from the rules-based international order, uh, to benefit from the dollar, to develop from the trade. And, you know, the, the, the world system is stacked in America's favor, and that could be under threat. But it's not the Russians are going to march into Pittsburgh tomorrow. Yeah. But for the Europeans, there is a threat of the Russians marching into the EU yeah. and, and entering direct conflict in the not too distant future. And so that's why the Europeans are as carried and are acting now, finally. Mm -hmm. One of the things we've talked to authors about, too, mm -hmm. is the chip battle that went on and mm -hmm. that goes on. And so many... Mm -hmm different products and chips and everything that makes everybody's life comfortable in the world and especially Americans uh, in trying to get them uh, to fund Ukraine is a lot of these chips are multi-international. There's things in Germany and in yeah. parts of the EU that, that create the products that we like. And it's, it's all, it's all, you know, internationally based. And if we lose Europe, uh, or parts of uh, key parts of Europe, that's going to affect you know our prices here at home. Everyone loves to complain about this year, uh, uh, supply chain issues, all those sort of things. You know, we saw um, we, we were talking with an author about Europe and and how much uh, that if if it were to fall could imbalance you know our global supply, our trade supply, could balance the, unbalance the whole world because we're so dependent upon these chips and this and this stuff and then the future of AI of course and in war et cetera et cetera. So it's uh it, it's quite extraordinary to see where we're at with America's attitudes of being lazy fair and just being like, oh, you know, whatever and you're just like, holy crap, like do you understand how bad this can get? I mean once he's you he, i think i think i heard you speak on um how putin uses the threat the extortion of of uh of nuclear war to advance his things and if we if we if we keep falling back whenever he rattles that sword um he can do that all through taking over and attacking nato right well, i mean i mean you spoke about the chips obviously the biggest and most important producer of chips right now is taiwan 
mm -hmm. and the fate of Taiwan is very much directly linked, I think, to the fate of Ukraine. Mm -hmm. Because if if America walks away from Ukraine mm -hmm. after making all these pledges and commitments to stay with it, for, stand with it for as long as it takes, uh, what lesson will the Chinese government draw about yeah. the Latin American reaction to Taiwan, uh, to it taking over Taiwan? And also, more importantly, what lesson will the Taiwanese draw? And I think the lesson they will draw is that why resist? Might as well surrender to, to the Chinese government. Yeah. Uh, and so, uh, and that will have a direct impact, you know, obviously on America standing in the world, on its ability to, uh, you know, maintain its industrial base and trade and the dominance of the dollar and, and you name it. Yeah. America is the biggest beneficiary of the current international system, which is at risk. Mm -hmm. And that system was based on America's commitment to defend its allies, which is not in question. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, that we lose Taiwan right now. We have a real problem with chips. I mean, I saw a lot of companies during COVID with the supply chain that, you know, just small companies that were, you know, manufacturing like little, little things here and little electronics things there. Uh, we, we did a lot of reviewing of products before uh, COVID. And, mm -hmm. you know, I, I had companies that were telling me, we can't get the chips, Chris. We're, we're dead in the water right now. Um, because the supply chains can't get the chips to us, we lose like Taiwan. And you know, if you're com if you're an American complaining about prices of shit right now, yeah, you have no idea what what sort of hell is going to rain down if 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 we lose Ukraine, if we lose Taiwan. You know, even like Ukraine, I had no idea that you know they provided so much sunflower seed to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, there's manure. Well, it's not called manure fertilizer. I suppose is the better way of saying it. Yeah. Uh, you know, they were they were leading. Um, production for a lot of food in the world wheat yeah yeah, food export. yeah. And, uh, and thanks to the drones it's now exporting again because by sending the last fleet ukraine was about able to reopen uh its main port there you go well it, it and they've exposed the russian military as being just a almost a, a stack of cards that that fell and uh they're doing such a great job with with uh and really changed the face of war. I mean, watching them drop bombs on those popcorn tanks where the turrets fall off. I mean, I, I wouldn't even want to be in a tank if I was a Russian soldier. I'm just like, that sounds like the worst place to be. Yeah, tanks are not having a good time in this war. And yeah. you know, I think a very small percentage of tanks of either side are destroyed by the tanks. Yeah, you know, The tanks were built for tank battles, and that doesn't exist anymore because they yeah. get taken out by drones now. Yeah, it's just crazy. Well, uh, any give us your final thoughts as we go out. Tell people where to buy the book and, and the final pitch out, sir. Yeah, well, I mean, you can buy the book anywhere. Bookstores, choice, you know, Amazon, websites, uh, other online retailers. Uh, and, you know, the book is really, uh, you know, you know as, no matter how many feelings I may have myself, I'm just trying to take myself out as much as possible. I'll just be the sort of roving camera. Mm -hmm. uh, cinema verite, if you will, just taking the reader to all these places, letting the reader see with their own eyes and, and speak, you know, through me. Uh, to people actually doing things, you know, to see how the world looks, how it smells. It's it's really visual and descriptive. And uh, it, it is the biggest war Europe has seen uh, in, you know, since 1945. Uh, it is a conflict that is really decisive, I think, to the future of our world. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's also, uh, you know, a, a war uh, that has stories of people that are really that mm -hmm. need to be told. Yeah, the human element. I mean, these are these are families. These are human people. These are people yeah. with dreams who want to, you know, uh, do what and, we and do. These are like people who happiness. thought until the last day that the war will never come to them. Mm -hmm. because they didn't believe it could happen to them mm -hmm. I and think, lots of other people in the world right now think it can never happen but it can yeah and you know it, it, the human toll is extraordinary and not to minimize it in any way shape or form but the, the beauty of ukraine and its centuries old buildings and and architecture and seeing russia just basically do the syrian sort of uh, thing of just leveling cities and destroying everything and of course as you mentioned pre in the show they just want to do a genocide too where they just want to wipe basically ukraine off the map and make it russia and uh, and probably put people into uyghur type camps that they do in china um to to re-educate them you know we, we can't let this happen 
and uh, it, it's just so important. So I hope everyone reads your book. I hope everyone gets it. Have you thought about mailing it to all the GOP members in the House? <laughs> Uh, well, we we have giving it to quite a few, not, not just GOP. You know, you I think uh, every every uh, Senate committee chair and ranking member has got it. Good, good. So if you now, Johnson, send him an autographed copy. So. <laughs> Uh, put a Bible on the cover and maybe he'll read it, um, you know, in case it. Um, so thank you very much for coming to the show. We really appreciate it. So thank you on show. Comms, where we want people to find you on the interwebs and, and follow you on social media. Yarrowtroff.com. There you go. Thank you very much, sir, for coming on the show. Thanks, for us for tuning in. Order the book wherever fine books are sold. Stay out of these alleyway bookstores because they're dangerous. I got mugged in one. Uh, his book is entitled Our Enemies Will Vanish, The Russian Invasion and Ukraine's War on Independence, out January 9th, 2024. And I'm hoping the next time we have him on, we get to talk about Ukraine winning this war or at least something to just stop the advance of Russia that works good for the Ukrainians. Uh, thanks, for us for tuning in. Be good to each other. Stay safe, and we'll see you guys next time. And that should have a